The Rings of Power is the biggest budget TV show ever, set in probably the most loved ever fantasy world. But should you watch it? Let's take a look. Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover the best in fantasy fiction. The Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher and more. Welcome. I'm writing this introduction to The Rings of Power in advance of season two of the show, so please take everything here in that context. And there are obviously some small spoilers here. I'll try to keep them to a minimum, but, well, this world was created nearly a century ago, and one of the world's most successful movie trilogies ever is essentially a sequel. So, well, you know. We all know The Lord of the Rings, not just the biggest and most genre-defining fantasy story of all time, but one of the biggest-selling books of all time. Forget all other pretenders, The Lord of the Rings is THE fantasy franchise. Though I suspect that Tolkien would have balked at the concept of his creation being a franchise, it was a legendarium to him. That said, the books sold hundreds of millions of copies, the films are some of the most watched and winniest, if that's even a word, films ever, and now Amazon have the rights to make TV shows in this world, in the world's most expensive TV rights deal. This is a massive deal. Actually, the exact rights that have been bought are an issue that we should probably briefly address first up. Rather than remake either of the two main stories, Amazon made the decision to tell the story of the Second Age of Middle-earth, something that has never appeared on screen before, and that Tolkien wrote about in less detail than The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings. A lot of important things happen in that age, We'll get onto that in just a moment, but there are also a lot of massive gaps in the timeline, and a lot that we do know is in books like The Silmarillion and The Book of Lost Tales that Amazon do not have the rights to. They do, however, have the rights to the extended appendices to The Lord of the Rings, and can use some other details on a case-by-case -case basis with permission from the Tolkien estate. And so you know, yes, Amazon do have the rights to make other shows in Middle-earth if they so wish. They haven't announced anything yet but the option is there. So what does all that mean in practical terms? Well, it depends on how purist you want to be with adaptations of Tolkien's Legendarium. For what it's worth, unless you are the kind of person who knows their Silmarillion back to front, you probably won't even notice most of the changes. The geography is the same, there are still elves, dwarves, orcs and so on, and a lot of the visual landscape echoes the Peter Jackson films closely. If you were a Tolkien geek like me, though, you may still enjoy the show on its own merits, but be left a bit bemused by why so many unnecessary changes were made to Tolkien's majestic creation. Tolkien did leave big gaps in the timeline for other minds and hands to fill in, that's a quote from him, and this show does do that very well at times, but the changes also extend to some pretty fundamental parts of the Legendarium. For example, the entire setup around the forging of the Rings of Power, pretty central in a show called The Rings of Power, is changed from Tolkien's version. In any event, what has emerged so far is a rather loose adaptation of what Tolkien left us some of which is the result of the rights issue, but much is clearly creative decisions by the showrunners and writers. I won't go into all the changes here, you can check out my other videos if you're interested in diving deeper into the Legendarium, rather I'll set the scene for the show version of the Second Age. However, being clear about the first big change is necessary, the time compression. Tolkien's Second Age covers about three and a half thousand years and includes some of the most important moments in the Legendarium. The forging and distribution of the Rings of Power, including Sauron forging the One Ring, the War of the Elves and Sauron, the rise and downfall of Numenor, the establishment of the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor, and then the last alliance of Elves and Men, culminating in the Ring being cut from Sauron's Finger. Basically, the scene-setting flashback intro that we get in Peter Jackson's film trilogy with Elrond and Isildur is the end point of the Second Age. In order to cover all that history in one show without changing actors every few episodes, it is all compressed on TV into a much, much shorter timescale. We join the action about a thousand years into the Second Age, and then the next two and a half thousand years are compressed into just a handful of years on screen. Our entry point is through a much younger Galadriel. It seems that she has been spending most of that thousand years hunting for Sauron. He killed her brother back in the First Age, then seemingly went into hiding somewhere in Middle-earth after his master Morgoth lost the war then. 
This version of Galadriel is not the calm, wise version we see in The Lord of the Rings. She is headstrong, proud, and always in the middle of the action. We also get a younger version of Elrond, a diplomat of sorts, based in the Kingdom of Linden under High King Gilgalad. The elves have been keeping an eye over Middle-earth, it seems, for signs of the shadow returning, but many are now rather complacent. Sauron has not only been missing for a very long time, but there are also no signs of him being active anywhere. Sauron is, it has to be said, the driving force behind most of the main action in Tolkien's Second Age, so the question of where or who he is forms a central part of Season 1. He is an immortal Maya, remember, who can still at this point take on different physical forms so he could be anywhere or anyone. I won't spoil that reveal if you are coming to this completely fresh, but by season two he is very much out in the open again, and with a packed agenda to get through. Rings to forge, humans to corrupt, lands to conquer, civilizations to destroy. He will be a busy character in the show's planned five seasons. One other elf we should mention is Celebrimbor, the legendary smith who is based in Eregion, just west of the Misty Mountains. His fate is very much tied in with the forging of the Rings of Power. And talking of the Misty Mountains, one of the visual delights of the show is the chance to see Khazad-dûm in its heyday. In The Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship pass through Moria, that long-abandoned dwarven stronghold, but here in the Second Age, the civilization is at its height, and as Gimli boasted, it isn't just a mine. It's a huge and intricately carved city, light, bright and full of life. We see a lot of King Durin, and particularly his son Prince Durin, and his wife Disa. Far out to sea lies the island kingdom of Numenor. This was established at the start of the Second Age by the humans who had fought on the side of the good guys in the Great Wars of the First Age, and Elrond's brother, though that's a whole other issue. Now, though, they have slowly sunk to a place of mistrusting and even hating the Valar and the elves who had previously been their allies. A great seafaring nation, and probably humanity's pinnacle in arts and technology, but a country divided. There are those who would cement the independence of the island from the elves on the mainland, and others who would renew those ties. Here there are characters that we know from the wider story. A young Isildur and his father Elendil, Queen Regent Miriel and her uncle Farazon. Back on the mainland, we see the reality of the elves' ongoing observation of Middle-earth for signs of the returning shadow. In the Southlands, we meet the apothecary Bronwyn and her son Theo, living in a village still being patrolled and treated with deep suspicion by the elves. Notably Arondir, though he seems to have a soft spot for Bronwyn at least. A thousand years after those villagers' ancestors had supported Morgoth in the War of Roth. The elves do have a point, though. Not all is right in that village. And where are the orcs hiding? And finally, we have the Harfords, a small migratory community of proto-hobbits. Our main character there is Nori, who discovers the Stranger, a wizard who fell to Earth in a comet. Who is he? He doesn't know. It's one of many mysteries in Season 1, as well as who or where is Sauron? What are the dwarves hiding? Why is Celebrimbor in such a rush to finish his massive new forge? Who is Halbrand, a rather shady but charismatic human who falls in with Galadriel early on in the season? And who is Adar and what is his plan? Adar is a corrupted elf we meet down in the Southlands a few episodes into the season. There's a lot of different plot lines spread across a continent, and most of them come together by the end of the first season. Many of the mysteries are solved too, though not all. The showrunners have been clear that they see this as a five-season arc, so we will have to wait for some things. For what it's worth, my own impression of season one is of many things to enjoy. The visual landscape supervised by legendary Tolkien artist John Howe is often breathtaking, and the musical landscape is similarly wonderful, credit to Bear McCreary there. There is a clear effort to try to uphold Tolkien's passions, a love for nature and language, for example, and there is no doubt that this has brought many people afresh to the books. On the flip side, Many have criticised the consistency of the writing quality, and if you're deep into Tolkien lore, there will be a lot here that strikes a discordant note, so to speak. If you were a Tolkien purist, this is perhaps not for you. Lots of liberties have been taken. 
Whereas judgment on the critical success of the show will probably need to wait until later seasons, it's clear that as far as Amazon are concerned, it is already a huge hit. Vernon Sanders, the head of global TV for Amazon Studios, has already called it a tremendous success for the company, by far the most watched TV show they've ever made, driving many more Prime memberships, selling many more books and so on. Amazon's success criteria are probably slightly different to HBO's, say. And if it's not to your particular taste, Tolkien fans are in an enviable situation. This world is so popular that there will always be another adaptation around the corner. As I write this, a new movie will be out in a few months' time, another is in the works, and more are being planned. New books of Tolkien's writings are coming out every year, several new video games are being developed, and if all that's not enough, the original books are still there, and always will be. If you'd like more videos with brief introductions to TV shows or book series that I enjoy, there's a playlist appearing now on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, thank you. There's a link now on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.